Today, uh, I want to talk about uh, doing federated machine learning on the beam and uh, uh, how we can smash the data bottleneck by doing so. Uh, a quick outline of the agenda uh, for the talk. Uh, um, how, how many of you here like do machine learning? Nice. Uh, and like, or just like, may not be doing it, but like just familiar with machine learning, what it is. Cool. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll spend like a, a quick two minutes on like just uh, you know giving a quick overview of like the big picture, like why we do machine learning and like where. Uh, it would be useful, um, and then like try to understand like what's this data bottleneck, and then like federated machine learning. We'll go over a few uh, challenges uh, in building such uh, federated machine learning systems, um, and then uh, uh, describe uh, what we did with our uh, uh, system, uh, which is basically a combination of uh, a Phoenix uh, uh, PubSub system uh, with uh, Perlang, which runs uh, this you know, little uh, interesting, beautiful piece of software called Epic Box uh, from uh, the good folks at Stepic. Um, and then uh, we'll go over uh, some uh, uh, algorithms that we are uh, uh, working to build uh, uh, into the uh, system. Um, and then like outline some future work and, and we have some references for you to uh, follow uh, after the talk. Okay. Um, so wh where is machine learning useful and like wh where is it not? Um, I, I think like a, a very good way to uh, develop a mental model for this is in the context of supervised machine learning uh, where you're trying to uh, understand uh, a particular phenomena uh, in relation to something that you have been observing. Like let's say for example, why is it so sunny today and like it's going to rain tomorrow? Right? But then there are some things that you have been observing and you're trying to reason about this phenomenon that you're seeing some variability in terms of the things that you have observed. You're trying to build some kind of like relationship. Now, if it is a pure mathematical or like functional relationship, you don't need machine learning because like functions are always deterministic. You give like one set of inputs, you always get the same answer as the output. Where machine learning will help you is when there is a statistical relationship between the inputs and the outputs, between the uh, phenomenon that you want to reason about to understand the variability and the things that you have been observing that you have a hunch about like that could explain that variability. Like, you know, housing prices, like why, why is uh, there is so much variation in housing prices? Uh, it could be like location, it could be like the size of the house, it could be the material that it was built with, but then, the same kind of material, the same kind of uh, uh, area, uh, the same kind of uh, floor plans would be uh, like you know of different prices uh, in different areas and you know other kind of probabilistic factors. So that is a kind of relationships which are statistical and probabilistic in nature uh, that are really good candidates for machine learning. This is a simple uh, illustration to uh, uh, give you an idea of. Uh, that box, which is basically that statistical relationship that you're trying to determine using machine learning between the inputs and outputs. And deep learning is basically like another uh, uh, special case uh, where like instead of just uh, having this like, you know, one box uh, between like your inputs and outputs, you're kind of like uh, chaining up like a few boxes and uh, trying to approximate that statistical relationship. Now, all of this is is uh, very much dependent on on data. I mean, like if you don't have any data, there's no machine learning. And the reason uh, why machine learning and AI uh, have uh, become so uh, prevalent in our day-to-day -day lives uh, in the past like decade or so is due to the ease uh, at which it has become to collect data. Since we are collecting more and more data. Uh, businesses find uh, uh, it compelling to uh, analyze every bit of data that they can to uh, gain some kind of an edge or like you know advantage over their competition uh, by using machine learning. Now, as the data uh, that we are collecting uh, grows, 
um, um, that's where like the bottleneck is happening is because the traditional way of building machine learning systems, uh, uh, even like today, like the most cutting edge uh, uh, that you have in production, uh, involves uh, a data collection software, uh, which basically uh, is deployed at the source where the data is being generated. It could be the browsers, it could be the uh, devices, uh, the sensors, uh, it could be um, some kind of like uh, you know servers. Um, all these data collection softwares collect these raw data and then uh, send it to a elaborate uh, complex data engineering pipeline that would extract, transform, and then like load the uh, all, all the data from these several different sources into a centralized data warehouse. It could be in the cloud or in in, in some data the data center on prem. Uh, and then that's when like you have your team of data scientists gaining access to that particular uh, data warehouse, uh, trying to analyze the data, build machine learning models, um, and then uh, generate some kind of like intelligence insights uh, for the downstream applications to consume. As you can see, the amount of data that is growing along with the uh, number of devices that are being deployed, uh, like that pipeline that uh, we are talking about, which um, which basically uh, collects all the data from different sources and puts it in a centralized uh, uh, data center, that kind of like becomes a bottleneck because that now results in uh, a slow uh, process, uh, which is also very expensive in terms of both compute and human resources. Um, and, and that and that also comes with uh, its own challenges for the downstream uh, uh, data science teams that are trying to analyze such big data sets because now you need specialized expertise to build models uh, with the algorithms that are capable for learning from such big data. So this uh, motivates the uh, need for federated machine learning which comes with a promise of uh, uh, making it uh, uh, less complex uh, by breaking things down into smaller components um, and uh, promising a faster and better reach uh, for your machine learning models. So as opposed to uh, uh, a centralized uh, a machine learning system, if you, if you do like a, a a simple word cloud on all the literature that you can find with federated machine learning, this is what we see is like, uh, it's it's more local. So now that like you have cut down on all those uh, data engineering pipelines that ship the data from the source to a centralized data warehouse, you are now uh, learning locally from whatever data that is being generated at the source, and it's distributed because like you are now learning locally at several different clients, and then like it's device specific because again like you know due to the local. Uh, you share the updates, and then like there is uh, uh, privacy, uh, which I'll come to uh, in a little bit. Um, so yeah, the, the, this is basically what you uh, uh, the main essence of federated machine learning uh, is. Uh, as compared with the previous illustration, this is like much simpler. Uh, as you can, so there, there are these uh, uh, local pieces of uh, models that you are learning uh, uh, at a smaller sample sizes as the data is being generated. Instead of uh, collecting them and shipping it to a central server and then learning, you are now starting to learn as the data is being generated. And then sending small updates to the uh, uh, a global server which performs a model aggregation. So this is like one of the uh, uh, very uh, important steps in federated machine learning is um, you're not only learning uh, from the data that is being generated locally, but you also have the benefit of the uh, other data sets that are generated in several other devices by getting the updates from a global server. So the clients send the uh, local updates to a global server, and the global server does the aggregation and uh, uh, sends back the uh, updated model to the uh, local devices. So that's like one of the ways you can avoid overfitting, which is another uh, um, very important aspect to consider when you're building machine learning systems is uh, you don't want to build a machine learning system that is too specific for the data that you're looking, uh, and you want to be generic enough so that like the model will be able to handle uh, data that it hasn't seen before. 
So what really motivates uh, federated machine learning? Uh, this covers uh, a bunch of uh, um, uh, reasons that we have touched upon uh, uh, briefly. But here is a, uh, a nice uh, diagram that I found in this uh, uh, great uh, uh, review paper. Uh, this is uh, this I found it very interesting, especially because like this review is done from a software engineering perspective, as opposed to like some kind of like an academic perspective, uh, which is. Uh, uh, uh usual in, 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 in such kind of review papers. Um, but uh, this paper has done the review in a very software engineering perspective uh, that lays out uh, why people want to do federated machine learning. As you can see, like the biggest reason is data privacy. Um, I'll, I'll come to that in a bit uh, in my later slides. Um, another big reason is uh, because like it's very efficient in terms of communication, uh, try to, trying to uh, generalize your models, uh, collaboratively learning from several different uh, local devices, uh, computationally efficient. Uh, it is able to handle uh, system heterogeneity. Again, like you know, you have billions of devices which are like very different from each other. Like there are like sensors, there are like edge devices, and then there are like uh, uh, like huge powerful systems in the cloud. Every bit of uh, uh, data that is collected from these several different uh, devices is being analyzed locally that causes this uh, system heterogeneity. And then there is like statistical heterogeneity, which is the inherent uh, heterogeneity that is built in due to the uh, distributions of the data. The, the, this due to the difference in the source uh, or the data is being generated at, there is a uh, heterogeneity that is uh, inherent, uh, which is of statistical in nature. So that is another reason uh, uh, federated machine learning is also adopted. Model performance and then like storage limitation are like one of the uh, uh, like minor reasons. So, what challenges would one face uh, uh, while building uh, such systems? Um, uh, federated machine learning is is fundamentally a distributed system, and it comes with every bit of a challenge that any distributed system would uh, uh, throw at us. Um, you have uh, to take care of like you know efficient communications, uh, you need to take care of the heterogeneity both system and the statistical uh, natures. Uh, you need to focus on you know making things like secure. Uh, you need to make sure that your system uh, is reliable at the global level and also at the local level. And you need to take care of the performance uh, and then like scalability. And I think like by now like it's kind of like uh, uh, obvious because like these kind of uh, challenges. Uh, I feel particularly lend uh, federated machine learning uh, the perfect candidate uh, for a system to be built on Beam. Uh, because like, I mean, uh, the, the goodness that we get with uh, building uh, systems uh, using this, uh, the Beam stack uh, will uh, take care of many of these challenges for us uh, uh, natively. So, what are we trying to do uh, uh, here uh, is um, uh, with, uh, with the uh, uh, Switch ML, uh, which is the, the uh, framework that we are building uh, for federated machine learning. Um, we are combining a Phoenix server uh, with uh, a, a Perlang server uh, that runs uh, an Epic box, which is, again, uh, it's basically like a, a piece of uh, a Python software that is able to run uh, any user-defined code uh, in a secure, isolated manner in containers. So we are combining uh, a Phoenix server with the uh, Perlang server. So you, uh, so users, the clients, can run their client-specific uh, model aggregations code uh, in a secure uh, uh, and reliable manner using uh, Epic Box. And uh, here is the uh, uh, GitHub link for the uh, source code. Um, I will go through some of the uh, uh, important uh, code snippets uh, in the uh, uh, code base. But you feel free to uh, check out the uh, code base and uh, please uh, 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 create any issues uh, if you find any uh, problems with it or if you want to make more contributions uh, here. Um, so at the at the core of uh, uh, the code base are these uh, two uh, channel handlers that we created in the Phoenix server. Uh, one is to uh, create a strategy, and another is to execute a strategy. Uh, a strategy is this uh, uh, piece of unit, uh, uh, the the code block that is responsible uh, for handling the model aggregation at the global level. 
So when the updates come uh, from mod when the model updates come from the local devices to the global server, the server needs to follow some kind of strategy uh, like that would uh, um, that would uh, guide like how the these updates are being uh, merged into a global model. Um, you could you could go with building like one global model for all the clients, or you could go with uh, um, a personalized uh, uh, strategy where you are only combining uh, uh, the clients that behave in a certain way uh, and not try to um, uh, uh, give a global model for every client. Like, let's say, for example, you are building a uh, federated machine learning model for a recommendation system on an e-commerce uh, application. Uh, you don't want to build one global model for like all your users uh, for the recommender system. You want to make sure that you are identifying clusters of users that behave similarly on on your website, that have similar preferences, so that uh, you'll be able to make uh, more effective recommendations. Um, so that is the kind of uh, strategies uh, that you can create with these channel handlers. Um, and then like there is the uh, uh, execute channel handler, uh, which comes in after the create. Uh, you can call and execute with every client update. When you send the update to the global model, you can call in the uh, you can uh, sp specify this event execute with the name of the strategy that you want to execute against that particular input. And uh, this this is the uh, data structure that we use uh, to maintain the state inside the application. Um, currently, it is uh, still uh, uh, at the process level in the sense like if you uh, if you try to scale the system by creating more services instead of processes, uh, this may not work. Uh, the, like the next logical step is to kind of like abstract this data structure into a database and kind of like add persistence layer and all. But for now, uh, this is what we are using. Uh, it's basically a, a simple uh, message uh, structure where like you store the uh, strategy name and uh, the uh, script uh, that defines that particular strategy. Uh, and then like you also store its uh, state, like what is the current uh, value for that particular uh, strategy. So this is, this is uh, where uh, our Phoenix server and the Perlang server uh, uh, communicate with each other. Um, the flow is basically when uh, the, the local devices, the clients, uh, start sending updates to the Phoenix server. Uh, the Phoenix server uh, uh, reads the uh, message. Uh, it identifies uh, that it is a certain type of event. Let's say, for example, execute. Uh, it reads uh, what, what, what's the latest input from the client device. Uh, and then it identifies what strategy uh, it needs to apply on that particular input, and it uh, sends that it forwards that message to the Perlang server, uh, along with the uh, uh, necessary inputs for the epic box to execute uh, uh, the uh, the code in the containers. Now, inside the Perlang node, uh, we we first initiate uh, uh, the node uh, with you know setting up uh, the uh, uh, um, uh, processes with some. Uh, uh, so the data is one uh, uh, input that we are sending, um, and then like we have a script, uh, which is basically uh, uh, something that the client devices would provide when they um, send a message with a create event. Uh, when they want to create a particular strategy, they also they also have to send a, a script along with that strategy for the epic box to execute. So that's what we specify here. Um, and then uh, we use uh, a uh, this is a, uh, the main script is like a uh, like a simple hack that we uh, had to put in uh, to be able to uh, pass in the inputs for the strategy dynamically. And here is the uh, epic box uh, uh, piece of code. So what we need to do is first we need to define a profile. Uh, in this case, uh, we uh, have created a Docker image uh, called uh, uh, Perlang POC ML. Uh, it basically contains like all the depend all your uh, usual uh, dependencies for a machine learning system like TensorFlow, Scikit-Learn, Pandas, etc. Uh, and we are we are creating a, a profile called Python uh, for the Epic Box to execute. You could have like other uh, profiles like you know if you are using a C++ client devices or you might be using like Julia, uh, which is uh, getting very popular in the scientific uh, computing community for machine learning. You could use Julia uh, containers as a profile. Um, and you're configuring the epic box with that particular profile, um, and basically, like you know, creating a command for the epic box to run when it starts spins up the container inside it. 
Um, and then capturing the result uh, by calling the run function from the epic box. Uh, you mention the profile, uh, you mention, uh, uh, you pass in the command that you want to run, uh, and then like, you know, the input uh, data. So this is, this is uh, uh, how the system looks like. Uh, you have the global uh, level at the top, and you have all these like local uh, uh, systems. As you can see, like you know, it could be like very heterogeneous system. Uh, some of the clients could be using uh, uh, Python and like you know, doing machine learning using like TensorFlow, PyTorch, etc. Uh, some of the clients could be using C++ based uh, libraries. Like you know, one of the uh, recent ones that came out from uh, Facebook is called Flashlight, uh, which is great uh, C++ library for machine learning. Um, and then, like let's say Julia, like you know, if someone wants to use Julia, you could you could build like very heterogeneous system at the client level and still use uh, a uniform communication protocol like WebSockets in this case uh, to interface with the uh, global server, uh, which is uh, again like Phoenix, uh, Perlang, and the Epic Box. Um, and again, like and as I said, like with the create method, with the create event that you uh, send in the messages to the server. Uh, you can add any kind of script that you want to execute in the global server for the uh, model aggregation. You could provide it as, as a Python script. You could provide it as a C++ uh, uh, code. You could provide it as a Julia uh, piece of code. So it's a, it's a very heterogeneous, extensible uh, kind of a system. Um, a, a few algorithms that we are uh, implementing, uh, like kind of like building it into the system. Uh, uh, one of the, uh, uh, some of the more uh, uh, common uh, ones that you find in federated machine learning research. Um, again, just a quick over, uh, like a, a recap of uh, uh, what happens at the global level. Uh, model aggregation is like a, a central uh, piece uh, that happens at the global level. Um, you could aggregate uh, these local updates in like two different ways. You could do like a simple aggregation, like just like a, a, a mean kind of an aggregation, which is like what you see in the first uh, equation. Or you could perform some kind of like weighted aggregation. Now, like what kind of uh, strategy that you use to determine these weights is again like you know up to the uh, 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 scientist, researcher, engineer. Uh, but these are like two different ways you could perform this uh, model aggregation. Um, so the first algorithm that uh, I would like to go through uh, is uh, uh, called random aggregation. Uh, you can find the citation uh, at the, in the footer of the slide. Um, so what, what's going on here is uh, the T is basically, you can think of T uh, as um, like time steps in the sense like there could be like two different kinds of federated machine learning system. One is kind of like infinite in the sense like it's continuously learning from data. Like the data is always like it's continuously being generated and like the system is always on. Um, or you can actually think of it as like some kind of like a finite value where like you are analyzing a fixed size data set uh, and you have kind of sharded the data set into like, you know, several different pieces and you're doing some federated learning research on it. So in that case, like it would be finite. Um, so for every T, uh, what you're doing here is uh, you're randomly selecting a, a subset of the clients. If there are like you know 10,000 or like 100,000 clients, you're randomly selecting a, a subset of those clients, um, and then uh, initiate uh, a set of weights randomly and send to the clients uh, to start training uh, the machine learning model locally. Uh, the 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 Client uh, trains uh, locally with the mod uh, with the weights that were sent by the uh, uh, global model, and then updates uh, the uh, weights from the local data, and then uh, the updated weights, along with the performance metrics, are sent to the model, uh, so sent to the global uh, server, and the server aggregates uh, the weights uh, either by a simple uh, mean or by a weighted uh, aggregation, as we noted earlier. So the key here, like as the name suggests, is basically like the the server selects a, only a subset of clients to perform the aggregation at any uh, uh, time step t. So that enhances the random aggregation. So now we have uh, uh, a selective aggregation approach. So as opposed to the uh, previous algorithm where you are randomly selecting a subset of clients, now you are uh, being very selective 
based on the performance metrics that were sent back by the client after every uh, step. So when 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 the uh, training happens uh, iteratively, uh, the global server uh, receives uh, the performance metrics of how the model was performing at the local level for every client. And uh, based on the uh, uh, history of the performance and the data quality it is receiving from the clients, it will rank them accordingly. And that's like the R that you will use when you're uh, using the uh, um, uh, weighted models here. So uh, when you're doing the aggregation in, in like B, uh, that's what you'll be using uh, as the weighted uh, aggregation. Uh, this is the final algorithm that we have. Uh, it's called uh, FedProx. Uh, the biggest difference here is um, uh, the server now sets a, a time limit uh, in the sense like uh, it's not going to wait for the uh, clients to finish their local training uh, before it uh, starts aggregating the data. Uh, so it sets a, a time limit um, and it kind of like times out uh, if the client doesn't report back the updated weights uh, along with the performance metrics and data quality metrics uh, uh, for the aggregation to happen. And the other steps remain the same, like basically randomly chooses. Uh, uh, actually, in FedProx, you can also uh, apply the selective aggregation strategy. Uh, in a sense, uh, uh, when you're selecting the clients, you can use a selective policy, which is based on the historical performance and the data quality, or you can select them randomly. But uh, the important thing here is uh, the time limitation on the uh, uh, training cycle on the local side, which is the client side. Uh, some some future work there are like the federated machine learning is a very active uh, uh, research area uh, and uh, there are like a lot of different uh, uh, aggregation strategies aggregation algorithms that uh, the community is uh, uh, researching um, so yeah there's a huge scope to continue to work uh, uh, building uh, several different kinds of algorithms into the uh, system um, so privacy um, Private machine learning is is has become like very important uh, these days. Um, again, like you know, there's so many laws, so many uh, 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 governments are trying to come up with regulations to address uh, privacy concerns about like how businesses are using uh, uh, personal data and so on. Um, for example, like I, I was speaking to one of my uh, friends very recently who started working with a large uh, worldwide financial organization. Uh, it's been like almost six months since he started, but like he's he's still not able to. Uh, get any access to like some real data that he wants to uh, work on to analyze or build uh, uh, machine learning models on. Um, again, you know, regulatory concerns like it's such a, a, a big challenge to gain access to data, uh, and then like you know, being a, a globally distributed financial organization, the data is distributed across several different uh, data centers. Uh, uh, federated machine learning along with a privacy-preserving machine learning is uh, 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 what uh, their company is actively investigating. And one of the uh, very popular uh, um, ways of addressing the privacy issues in machine learning is to employ differential privacy algorithms. Again, like this is another uh, very actively being researched area. Uh, there are a lot of uh, open source uh, libraries uh, that have these op uh, differentially private algorithms to analyze data that we are trying to actually uh, bake into the system. Um, and, and then personalization. Uh, personalization is also a, a big deal and is also very important because like, it makes federated learning very practical because you, you don't want a system which uh, uh, aggregates updates from 100,000 clients. You want to take into account the heterogeneity. You want to make sure that uh, uh, you are uh, you know, balancing in that uh, uh, overfitting spectrum. You don't want to do zero aggregation which means like it's 100% overfit to the local sample. You don't want to do like, you know, 100% uh, underfitting, which is kind of like uh, aggregating uh, all the uh, 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 updates from all of the clients available. So you need to find that uh, uh, balance in, uh, when you're trying to uh, build this federated machine learning model. And the personalization uh, strategies uh, would come in like very handy uh, in to handle such uh, scenarios. Um, and then like, Evaluation metrics is also another area that is, because like federated machine learning is fairly new, 
uh, there's not much uh, um, uh, insights into like the kind of metrics that you can use uh, to rely on uh, in terms of evaluating the uh, uh, federated learning system as a whole. Uh, at the local level, when you are learning, like yeah, of course, like you have a lot of uh, metrics uh, that are kind of like established uh, in the uh, literature, like for uh, a lot of years. Uh, but that's another uh, area um, um, that you know could could uh, see a lot of work in the future. And yeah, that's it. Well, well, I, th I think we have time for questions. Uh, do do have any questions here? Also, those attending virtually, you can ask on Hoover, or if you want to, I don't know, open the the mic and oh, have a question here. Why peer lang? <laughs> uh, good question. Um, so we wanted. Uh, well, I'll just refer to the. Uh, yeah. So one of the. Uh, one of the important considerations uh, that went into that was uh, uh, the need to address the uh, requirement of uh, running uh, any kind of code, any I mean, like any programming language uh, uh, code when it comes to the strategies, because like um, you 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 don't know when you're building such uh, systems what kind of a uh, uh, environment that is being used to program at the local client level. So when you're, let's say like the data scientists are using uh, Python uh, to build machine learning systems at the local level and they want to experiment with some custom strategies uh, in Python. So you want to be able to uh, run those custom strategies in Python. Uh, like the, the speech recognition team at Facebook might be interested in running Flashlight. You know, they have all their systems in Flashlight and C++ and they might want to actually experiment with some uh, you know, ag new uh, aggregation strategies and using C++. Same goes with like Julia and so on. So, um, we found Epic Box uh, as a as a great way to uh, uh, isolate and like you know run those uh, aggregation strategies in a secure way. And Epic Box is a Python software, and hence we had to kind of like wrap it up in Perlang because like we wanted to uh, take advantage of uh, the Phoenix uh, communication channels. So that's your question. We have more questions. Oh, there's one here. Okay. Uh, I'm not a machine learning guru per se, but uh, do you have any any templates to for especially personalization? Uh, I mean, uh, in in personalization case, the data, well, where the data lives, resides, can be different. And not always we need like huge amounts of data, you know, so how, how do you approach that? Yeah, uh, we don't have any templates as such, uh, but I can, I can just like uh, uh, speak through like the kind of ideas uh, that uh, we are putting together in, uh, in terms of addressing the personalization scenarios is, um, when the when the update starts to come in from these clients, let's say for example you have like a million clients, and it's probably not practical to kind of again like in, due to that overfitting underfitting spectrum, uh, you want to build a personalized model depending on like the kind of data that is being generated at these uh, sources. Um, one way to do that is when you are receiving these performance metrics and the uh, data quality metrics back from the clients to at the global level. Uh, you can incorporate uh, some kind of analysis uh, uh, into your strategy uh, to analyze these data quality metrics and the performance metrics coming in from every client, and then uh, cluster them into like you know uh, similar uh, groups. So that saying like okay, like among this like million clients, we have identified like I don't know 1,000 clusters. Uh, these like thousand clusters uh, kind of like give us that kind of like a balance uh, uh, in bit, uh, from like you know uh, overfitting and like underfitting. Uh, so yeah, that's one way. Like you could analyze the historical performance and the data quality metrics to cluster the clients into different groups, and then uh, build uh, 
uh, a different aggregated model for each of those uh, 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 1,000 plus uh, groups. That's that's like one idea. I mean, there could be like other uh, uh, different uh, strategies, but that's something that we are working on uh, building into the system. Yeah, it's a pr interesting question. Thanks. Yeah, what I had in mind was uh, like mm, cases like I don't know uh, video streaming uh, Netflix, mm -hmm. which is different than e-commerce. Mm -hmm. uh, what what you described. Uh, mm, Sounded like more like the case for the e-commerce. Okay. So for yeah, the yeah, I think um, yeah, uh, that is definitely. I think it's definitely different, and also sounds like a little bit more complex than the e-commerce one. Um, maybe you, but I, th I I think like still uh, behavior is is the central uh, idea behind both the approaches. I think even in the, in the streaming video streaming case. Uh, you should probably uh, uh, come up with a strategy at the global server, which would uh, try to identify clusters of behaviors. Like, okay, these group of individuals uh, are all interested in like you know action, uh, uh, kind of like genre, kind of like movies. They, they have been watching these kind of like movies. So it depends on like uh, uh, coming up with strategies on the server side that will be able to identify groups of behaviors that it can then build uh, 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 aggregated models to that particular group and not generalize across the groups. So that's one way to you know, go about it. All right, I uh, think, think we're done or, yes, so thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you everyone, thanks for your time.